Coming up on this edition of Out of the Blue from Middle Tennessee State University. We talk about our new horse science major and we find out about some of the national honors won by our equestrian team and stock horse team. We catch up with our operations in international student affairs and we learn about some of the activities planned for the fall. And we meet Murfreesboro's Poet Laureate, an instructor in our English department, and she shares with us some of her work. I'm Andrew Ottman, and this is Out of the Blue. Welcome to Out of the Blue, I'm Andrew Ottman. MTSU has long been known for its equestrian programs and its continued popularity and success prompted the university recently to create a major in horse science. That new major comes with news about our national honors by our stock horse and equestrian teams. Ariel Heron and Andrea Rigo joins us to talk about our equine success. Well, Ariel and Andrea, welcome to the program. We're glad to have you, our first in studio, out of the blue, since March 2020. And what a great accomplishment for us to celebrate here. So let's start with the beginning. Let's go with the news. What recently happened, the honors for the Stock Horse team? Uh, talk about that competition. So the MTSU Stock Horse team traveled and got permission to travel to Sweetwater, Texas in April. And they came home with five national champion and reserve champion titles and they came home with fourth place overall team. That's fantastic, congratulations. Thank you, they worked really hard all semester. A lot of these girls ride also for the equestrian team. Our teams within the horse science program pretty much work together in terms of learning and improving and progress. So Ariel will talk more on how the riding program works, but these girls worked really hard to get where they were at and improved throughout the semester. So Andrea, talk to me about the organization that holds this competition, uh, describe them for us. So the American Stock Horse Association is the national organization that holds this competition every year in April and except for last year. Mm -hmm. And every year they host colleges from all over the country. We are the only team east of the Mississippi that comes all the way to Texas every year. And we compete against teams within Texas, um, Wyoming, Montana, uh, Arkansas. They all come to Central Texas to compete in the Collegiate National Show. Mm -hmm. And they also have the National Show that is separate from the Collegiate that we also compete in. And for those who may not be familiar, we're using the term stock horse and stock horse team. Can you describe for me what that is and, and how that works? So the idea of a stock horse team is to encompass the versatility of a ranch horse. And all of these events create the versatile and all around type of ranch horse that includes ranch horse pleasure, uh, reining, cow horse, and trail. And so those events are all put together in um, an all around score that gives these riders a high point uh, within that competition. The Tennessee Stock Horse Association is an affiliate. And so we put on shows locally in Tennessee um, to help facilitate the versatility ranch horse. That's wonderful, that's wonderful. Well, Andrea kind of cued you up a little bit to, to talk about what, what we're gonna be asking next. You're our Director of Equestrian Programs at MTSU. Talk about what goes into uh, all these programs and how the stock horse team fits into what we offer. So our program has several levels of riding offered for our students. And within that, we have two riding teams. So we have the stock horse team that Andrea talked about that she coaches, and then I coach the equestrian team, okay. uh, which is a, a little different in the origin and kind of what we do, but we share a lot of the same people and Andrea also assists with the equestrian team. So we work together for pretty much everything. Wonderful. Yeah, and our equestrian team back in May competed um, at a pretty prestigious event and came home champion team. So we compete in the Intercollegiate Horse Shows Association. It's a nationwide organization that has about 400 member schools and about 10,000 riders across the country. And this year, our national, and last year, our national championships were canceled due to COVID. Mm -hmm. And so this year, uh, they put on an event for us called the Collegiate Celebration. So a little different than our nationals, but still drew people from all across the country. I think there were 16 schools represented at the 
uh, collegiate celebration, mm -hmm. and our team came home champions. That's wonderful. Yes. So we've got success at both of the teams at, at high levels, mm -hmm. and that's that's terrific. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about the, uh, the, the major itself, the horse science major. Uh, I know that's quite an accomplishment. We just got it approved very recently. Mm -hmm. So uh, walk me through what that entails. So our horse science major, like you said, just got approved this year. We've been a concentration within, within animal science for many years. Our faculty worked together to create our own major, and so we're really excited about that. So when a student comes to us to be a horse science major, a lot of the times our students are interested in being horse trainers or equine veterinarians. Mm -hmm. And what our students learn to find is that those are two really difficult uh, careers to get into and very all-encompassing of your entire life basically. So our goal at Horse Science is to make our students aware of what it takes to be those and also to make them aware of all the other things that you can do within the horse industry. We're all very passionate about horses obviously, that's what got us here. And so we want our students to see all the opportunities that are within the horse industry outside of just those two. How important, Andrea, is it to have this kind of success for visibility uh, for students? Are we on the map uh, because of our great students uh, and their efforts? Well, I would say that MTSU has been on the radar forever. Mm -hmm. We have been up and running for over 30 years and thank you to Dave Whitaker, Dr. Dave Whitaker and Ann Berzicki who are foundational um, parts of this program. We've had long-standing success on the horse judging team, the equestrian team, and then the MTSU stock horse team is more recent, but uh, all three teams have contributed to putting this program on the map and with the rise in you know, the last decade of social media really reaching out to uh, mm -hmm. a variety of people, I feel like Yes, we are more on the map now than ever due to all of our success, but yes, it's so important for our students to have this program behind them when they go out in the industry and try to get their first career um, started. Obviously, for everybody, the pandemic posed challenges. How did, how did your operations pivot during all of those restrictions and changes? How, how, did, yes. how did you go? Uh, Ariel teaches a lot of the riding classes. I teach one of them and um, we can't teach horseback riding online. You can't. It, it I guess that's so. what I was kind of leading to, right? I mean, yeah, there are certain things you can't you know, do I, online. I would say it, it halted for a minute there in the spring 2020, but in the fall, we really picked back up the riding classes. We kept all safety measures in place that the university recommended. And I think we did a great job in, in keeping things going as smoothly as possible. Ariel has a larger team with the equestrian team. She made quite a few adjustments with that and made it work really well. Mm -hmm. So what's ahead in 2021? Any changes that we can expect or hopefully just continued success? We hope to just be able to continue on. Every year brings its new set of challenges as seniors graduate and freshmen come in. So uh, we know of a lot of great students that are coming, but we also often have a lot of surprises with who comes and ends up being a great rider for our team or a great asset to our program. So we don't really know um, exactly who will be in ex um, precisely, but we're very excited to be able to be back on the road. Uh, we hope with a lot less restriction from the university and from our different organizations, the IHSA is, is planning to continue forward with their normal postseason competition schedule. So we're hopeful to be able to have a chance at the national championship again. That's fantastic. Andrea, I know you do a lot of outreach to veterans out there at uh, Horse Sciences. Can you uh, explain some of those programs to us and, and how we're serving our veterans? Yeah, so the Horse Science Program has a partnership with the VA and the Veteran Recovery Center, which is just 0.2 miles down the road uh, from our facility. And so we bring veterans from the Veteran Recovery Center over to the VA every spring and fall and some summer sessions to work with horses one-on-one -on -one in a recovery treatment program. And so these veterans are diagnosed with a serious mental illness of some sort. And they are deemed stable enough to participate in our program and they work one-on-one -on -one with horses with a uh, psychosocial uh, rehabilitative staff at their center and with me as the instructor and then students mentoring them through my equine assisted activities and therapies classes. Cool. Ariel and Andrea, congratulations to you both. You. We're very, very proud of your success and uh, good luck for the coming fall. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And we'll be right back.
The Charlie and Hazel Daniels Veterans and Military Family Center located at Middle Tennessee State University is the largest and most comprehensive on an academic campus in the nation. We lost our patriot Charlie on 6 July 2020. The creation of the General's Fund was his last public event in support of our military. So many men and women that have served, that expected to be able to have their tuition or certain assistance being given to them, that money evaporated. With the establishment of the General Fund is to make sure that all those men and women can get through MTSU and pursue what they thought they could do when they came on back. We're extremely proud that the Predators have identified the need to help make this fund one of the best at our university for our veterans. It's very important just for me personally that they offered this fund and I feel like there are a lot of students on campus like me whose benefits run out and they aren't aware of that. To be the first recipient of the General's Fund is truly an honor. I'm the person that if I'm a, the spokesperson or the face of something, I want to do it to my best ability and just to help share this experience with other students just like me who are military dependents on MTSU's campus that can receive help from the Daniels Center because everything here and in, in, in this center is just here to help us. What the General's Fund means to me, it's a help when I'm falling. So if I'm struggling or anything, I know I can come to the Daniels Center and they have me, they have a help for me, they have a way to figure things out. Join us, contribute to the continuation of Charlie's legendary support of our military. Nothing is more expensive than a missed opportunity that could have changed your life. Maybe you're just graduating high school, or are working and need to earn a degree to advance your career. Or you aspire to be a leader, and a graduate degree can make that happen. Whether you're just starting out or retooling for the future, Middle Tennessee State University can help you get there. MTSU, the University of Opportunities. Welcome back to Out of the Blue. I'm Andrew Ottman. MTSU is proud to be a destination for students, not only from across our state and nation, but around the world. Chelsea Abel from our International Student Affairs Office joins us to talk about the programs and services we offer to these scholars. Well, Chelsea, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. And uh, let's talk about international students and what we do to accommodate and serve them and how we present the campus. How large is our international student population? How, where are they from? Yeah, they're roughly from about 25 to 30 different countries, typically ranging from about 400 to 600 students currently enrolled per semester. Okay. And your office, uh, you know, I know you work with uh, Dr. Robert Summers, uh, our Vice Provost for International Affairs. Your office provides what uh, support to these students? What do y'all do to help them? Typically, we try to plan different events and really get them involved on campus. Um, because if they're coming from all the way across the globe, they want to know that they have a home here, they've got people they can meet, make new friends, make new connections. Mm -hmm. um, and so we help them in that regard, but we also help them make sure they're maintaining their visa status, um, making sure they're not exceeding work hours, or making sure that they are just staying in general within the guidelines that are set federally for our international students. Apart from that, we're really just there to support them in whatever way we can, helping them find employment here on campus, uh, and just guiding them through the process of being here in the U.S. Obviously, the pandemic was, uh, was quite a blow to all of our operations, and I know we're still managing through certain aspects of that, but international uh, students were particularly hard hit by this, right? Talk about what we had to overcome. Yeah, so some of the biggest issues were whether or not they could even return back to the U.S. Um, so we had a lot of students who were either trapped here in the U.S. or they were trapped at home and could not come either way. So a lot of students that were trapped here 
found themselves in issues of employment um, because a lot of the campus had shut down, so a lot of the jobs had shut down. So financially, it was very difficult. Um, and just being away from family during, you know, this interesting time. Interesting times yeah. indeed. <laughs> so obviously we're starting to turn the corner. The campus is resuming more of a normal operation. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned some events. Talk about some of those events that you're going to be putting forth. Yeah, so um, some of them are led by our international student ambassadors. Uh, so they lead one, which is called a, a cultural presentation. So they talk about their home country, different traditions back at home, different festivities, uh, different holidays, things like that, just to really show the diversity of our campus. Mm -hmm. um, we've also had international movie nights um, where they can send in like their favorite movies from back home, um, really just have that time to relax. And then we'll also do things like game nights, um, really just different events to keep them interested and mm -hmm. on campus. And, and you mentioned the ambassador program. Mm -hmm. Who are these ambassadors? How do they get picked and, and what do they do? These ambassadors are any of our international students who have been here for about a year, really have gotten to know what the U.S. life is like, mm -hmm. what classes here at MTSU are like, and what campus resources are available. Typically, once per year, so typically in the fall, um, so we're actually in the middle of our ambassador picking now, okay. so it's fun. Typically, what they do is they mentor new students because that was one need that we found that was lacking a little bit in our office, was that they really didn't have that contact person or that student to really guide them through as a student. Because mm -hmm. as uh, young as I like to think I am, I'm not as young <laughs> as the students. <laughs> and so I don't have exactly that connection that those current students do. And they can really guide them through different student events that are going right. on. Um, and a lot of them are plugged into their own student organizations. Um, so one of them was actually uh, now the SGA president. So he was an international student ambassador the first semester. Um, so he guided them through different events, different organizations that they can be a part of. And then also just helping with our marketing initiatives. Right. Um, so really just showing what international students are like on campus. Anything that uh, you want to tell folks about your program, about how to engage with you? If I, if, I assume you keep pretty good track of who our international students are, but where do I find out more information about your office and your services? Yeah, so a lot of it is posted on our website. Um, so we have different resources available for the students, things like just getting a driver's license, mm -hmm. how to get a social security number. So a lot of that's posted online, but of course we also have all of our contact information on our website as well that lists our position titles. Um, so they kind of know who to go to for different um, questions. Um, so like I typically handle the student service side, mm -hmm. um, but we have Cindy Habara who handles immigration. We've got Angie Parsons who handles admissions. So there are different roles um, that are listed on our website that you can kind of find who to go to for help. Um, and in general, we also have our international at mtsu.edu email that they can always reach out to if they have any questions Fantastic. as well. Well, Chelsea Abel uh, from our International Student Affairs Office. Chelsea, thank you for everything you do to help these students. Yeah, of course. Glad to do so. We'll be right back. Nothing is more expensive than a missed opportunity that could have changed your life. Maybe you're just graduating high school, or are working and need to earn a degree to advance your career. Or you aspire to be a leader, and a graduate degree can make that happen. Whether you're just starting out or retooling for the future, Middle Tennessee State University can help you get there. MTSU, the University of Opportunities. So many men and women that have served, that expected to be able to have their tuition or certain assistance being given to them, that money evaporated. With the establishment of the general fund is to make sure that all those men and women can get through MTSU and pursue what they thought they could do when they came on back. We're extremely proud that the Predators have identified the need to help make this fund one of the best at our university for our veterans. 
I am True Blue. As a member of this diverse community, I am a valuable contributor to its progress and its success. I am engaged in the life of this community. I am a recipient and a giver. I am a listener and a speaker. I am honest in word and deed. I am committed to reason, not violence. I am a learner. Now and forever. I am a Blue Raider. I am a Blue Raider. I'm a Blue Raider. True Blue. Nothing is more expensive than a missed opportunity that could have changed your life. Maybe you're just graduating high school, or are working and need to earn a degree to advance your career. Or you aspire to be a leader, and a graduate degree can make that happen. Whether you're just starting out or retooling for the future, Middle Tennessee State University can help you get there. MTSU, the University of Opportunities. Welcome back to Out of the Blue. I'm Andrew Oppmann. Amy Whittemore, a lecturer in MTSU's English department, is also serving as Murfreesboro's Poet Laureate. Amy joins us to talk about this great honor and her work to advance the arts. Amy, welcome to the show. We're glad to have you here. Thank you for having me. Uh, we are so proud of your honor, Murfreesboro's Poet Laureate. Can you describe what that means? And uh, obviously, was it a surprise? Did you know that this was going to happen? How did this, how did this work? Murfreesboro started a laureateship program in 2017, and I was friends with the first laureate, Corey Wells. Uh, so she had informed me of the program and encouraged me to apply and assured me it wouldn't be overwhelming, but it would be fun. <laughs> and so far it has proven to be the case. So a laureate basically combines their love of their artwork, which mm -hmm. in my case is poetry, with their love of the community. Um, so finding ways to connect people through poetry is what I do as laureate. Fantastic. And obviously you began this during the pandemic. <laughs> yes. So, and hopefully you're going to conclude this with maybe a return to normalcy, but let's talk about how the pandemic inf affected your outreach. Yeah, so the pandemic forced some creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, so early in the pandemic, I had this idea about um, a project that turned out to be dream geographies. And so many people were reporting uh, dreaming really vividly during the early pandemic. So I thought it would be cool to pair someone's dream description with a poet and visual artist and have them interpret that description through an online gallery. So those uh, results are on dreamgeographies.org and we've done that two times successfully. And uh, the third um, gallery, the third dream, as you will, uh, will be up shortly. So this is online, anyone can see it and experience this as well. Yep. And you've had some other projects too, Write With Pride, talk about that. Uh, Write With Pride is a series of writing workshops for LGBT plus youth in Middle Tennessee. Uh, and I run that with partnership with Southern Word, and it is funded through a laureate fellowship that I won from the Academy of American Poets. And will that continue beyond your service as Poet Laureate? Or? That is my dream. Okay. Uh, so we're in conversations about how Southern Word can kind of take more ownership of it, uh, but I will be helping with the program for at least another year. Well, and then Poetry in the Borough. Uh, tell us about that. Poetry in the Borough is the brainchild of Corey Wells, the former laureate, and a few poet friends of hers. And she started in 2016, and I joined her as a co-organizer shortly thereafter. And we wanted to create something that would symbolize the community that Poetry in the Borough represents. So again, through that fellowship that I won, we were able to create an arts calendar that featured poetry and photography from artists in the community. Uh, so we did that for 2021, and it was a great success, and we are currently seeking submissions for our 2022 calendar. And how can I find this calendar? Uh, you can go to poetryintheborough.org and find more information there. You're just living everything online, aren't you? That's wonderful. That is what the pandemic has <laughs> <laughs> provided for me. <laughs> well, okay, now, now we're looking at 2021 and maybe more in-person events. Mm -hmm. Do you know what's over the horizon for you, what you hope to be doing uh, um, in addition? I would love to have an in-person experience of the Dream Geographies project, like have people who have contributed so far exhibit their work in a live arena, share some of the poetry that they've read, uh, have the dreamers meet some of the people who worked with their dreams. So that's one of my hopes for, for late 2021. Uh, you're a lecturer in our English department. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about the, the courses you teach to our students. Um, I teach a variety of courses. I teach mostly the freshman writing sequence, English 1010 and 1020, and then also the sophomore literature class, uh, English 2020 with a science fiction focus, and an intro to creative writing class. Wow. 
did I hear science fiction? In <laughs> yes, that? you did. So, um, what's your favorite? Oh, I love Octavia Butler. She's okay. one of my favorite writers. And then I do also love Ursula K. Le Guin and Philip K. Dick, and I could go on and on. Wow. But I, I do like the more obscure writers. I try to like open up what people think science fiction is. That's really neat. I love the diversity of courses we teach at MTSU and, and finding that connection, something that interests you as a student to a professor that can kind of enlighten and, and, mm -hmm. and show new things to you. Well, let's take a step back and, and reflect on your love of poetry. How did that start for you? Where, where, where do you trace its origins? Well, it wasn't the most poetic start. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, it pun was, intended, right? <laughs> yes, it was a school assignment in my freshman high school English oh. class. We had to find 10 poems and write 10 poems. And I found in writing the poems for that assignment, I actually enjoyed it. And then when I went to college, I found out you could take classes on writing poetry, which was totally new to me. And I just have been doing it ever since. I put you on the spot. I asked you to pull up one of your poems um, from your phone. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I would love if you could share one of your favorites with our viewers. Yeah, uh, this is a short one that is in my book, Glass Harvest, and can also be found online at poets.org. It's called Spell for the End of Grief. No incantations, no rosemary and status, no keening women in grim dresses, no cauldrons, no candles, no hickory wands, no honey and chocolate, no sticky buns, no peonies and carnations, no handkerchiefs, no dark and lusty liaisons. Only you and me to see it out. Sweet self, let me wash your toes, brush your hair, let me rock you gently. Together we'll change the sheets and I'll pull you to me, little spoon. You be the marrow, I'll be the bone. That is beautiful. Thank you. And thanks for allowing, uh, letting me put you on the spot to read that. <laughs> no problem. Talk about uh, Glass Harvest, because I know that's been an accomplishment for you and uh, released in 2016, I believe? Yes, that's correct. So uh, describe that uh, collection uh, for me. That is a collection that explores grief, as this poem suggests. Um, it explores sort of the intersection of place. I grew up in the Midwest, mm -hmm. so it looks at my life on a farm there the death of my grandparents and then surviving going through a divorce and how all of those different griefs and places where I experienced them kind of come together, I suppose, through sort of the lens of my experience. As Poet Laureate, what, what's the big message that you want people who may not be as familiar with poetry to take away? What should I know and how do I get engaged mm -hmm. with this? I guess first I would say is don't be afraid. I think a lot of people are afraid of poetry because they think it has a riddle in it that they have to like solve. And if they can't solve the riddle, they can't enjoy poetry. And poetry is much more open than that. There are people who will share that love for you and encourage uh, your curiosity about poetry if you just get over that initial trepidation. Well, Amy, congratulations to you. It's a great honor for our university, the English department. And thanks for helping make the arts more accessible to people. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me today. And this does wrap up another edition of Out of the Blue. You can find news about the campus 24 hours a day by going to our website, mtsunews.com. You can also find special content on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I'm Andrew Ottman. Stay safe, stay on course, and remain true blue.